This is the secret world of Whitehall. Decisions taken here behind closed doors affect all our daily lives. In this three-part series, I'm telling the inside story of what's gone on over the years in the great institutions at the very heart of government. Tonight, the Cabinet Office. It's the secret powerhouse of British politics with the key task of keeping the government show on the road. It was here that the Cameron Clegg coalition deal was hammered out and the Cabinet Office houses the sinister sounding COBRA, the government's anti-terrorist intelligence and emergency centre. And it's where the most powerful unelected member of the government has his grand office. From here, the Cabinet Secretary, the real life Sir Humphrey from Yes Prime Minister, pulls the invisible strings across Whitehall. A year ago, the Cabinet Office in Whitehall became the centre of the political and media world. The Tories and the Lib Dems met to negotiate the coalition deal at a series of meetings behind the green doors of the normally camera-shy Cabinet Office. Green door, what's that secret you're keeping? What was it like for the Cabinet Office itself, which traditionally is rather anonymous as far as the public is concerned, suddenly the Cabinet Office was at the centre of political and media attention. Uh, it was definitely very exciting for the Cabinet Office because normally all the attention is on 10 Downing Street and that famous street outside. Uh, suddenly uh, I was very pleased that we'd repainted the door uh, because it was on all of those camera shots and uh, it was the centre of attention for a few days. Um, I'm glad it was only a few days. Cabinet Office, like many classic institutions in this country, with considerable power, is hardly known about outside. It's only the initiates who appreciate all the time just how important and significant it is. The Cabinet Office prefers to do its work out of the limelight. Its key task is to try and make government work properly. Its high-flying civil servants form a mini Whitehall who aim to coordinate policies and replace the traditional dogfights between ministries with what they call joined-up government. My first ministerial posting was in the Cabinet Office. A wonderful sort of piece of luck that I was able to see the centre of government operating. I mean, the Cabinet Office makes sure that every part of government is speaking to the other. It's like a sort of vast and rather intricate finely tuned telephone exchange. It sort of, you feel the plugs being put in, or, you know, ac across that board. The really important aspect of the um, Cabinet Office is to make government business happen. Uh, they're there to fix the meetings, they're there to uh, take the minutes, uh, they're there to find the compromises. The central part of the Cabinet Office's work is to ensure that the Cabinet and its powerful subcommittees work effectively. The Cabinet Secretary or his self-effacing senior officials attend all ministerial meetings to record the discussion and the decisions for action across Whitehall. These were backroom people who relished being out of the limelight. There was a deal done that for concealed influence and some would say power, there was anonymity while they were doing it, apart from the appearance in the odd honours list, when they would shimmer discreetly to the palace for a gong or an upgrade gong and back again. But as a friend of mine used to say, rather unkindly of some individuals, they were scarcely household names in their own household. There have only been ten cabinet secretaries in the past century since the cabinet office started, while there have been more than three times that many different governments. Until recently, there remained figures unknown to the public. For the cabinet secretary was the keeper of the government's secrets, for whom discretion was like the calcium in their bones. As the most powerful, permanent, unelected member of the government, he was the chief policy advisor and father confessor to the Prime Minister. In Whitehall, where knowledge is power, the Cabinet Secretary is the person who knows most of all. For unlike the Prime Minister, the Cabinet Secretary is allowed to see all the papers of previous governments, 
and when new prime ministers reach number 10, the first person who will greet them once they step inside is the cabinet secretary. When the new prime minister arrives, I'm waiting behind that door. First thing I say is congratulations, prime minister, and welcome to number 10. The prime minister and his top Mandarin then go to the cabinet room. And then we have a few words about what the first few bits of business are. There are various uh, nuclear and intelligence issues which new prime ministers uh, need to be briefed on very quickly. And one of the things the cabinet secretary has to do is to juggle those first 24 hours in uh, managing this process of getting the urgent uh, done uh, the urgent and important. In a sense, what's happening there is a, a wrestle for power. The, the Cabinet Secretary is trying to capture the Prime Minister. Here's the new Prime Minister, hasn't been in office, slightly in awe of this grand figure from the civil service, and he wants to establish the relationship straight away of mentor and mentee. And part of that is about trying to overawe the Prime Minister about his job, to put him in awe of what he's actually taking on here. The Cabinet Office on Whitehall adjoins Downing Street and is linked to number 10 by an internal corridor and there have been many subtle struggles for power between Prime Ministers and their top Mandarin for the Cabinet Office itself was born out of the barrel of a gun. The First World War revealed the need for a central command structure in the British government. There was a shambles of communication between the cabinet and the military, with orders being confused and not acted on. Things came to a climax with the Battle of the Somme. It cost 100,000 British lives. And it led directly to the creation of the cabinet office. It's a Johnny-come-lately as a government department. It, as it only started in December 1916. There had been a secretary of the Committee of Imperial Defence before that, but uh, it wasn't until Lloyd George came Prime Minister that he decided that they needed a cabinet secretary as a cabinet secretary. Of course, before that, the proceedings of the cabinet were not noted. So it was not uncommon for people to come out of those meetings for which there was no agenda and there were no minutes with different views as to what had been decided. It took the Kaiser in a total war to get Whitehall to sort itself out in terms of running a great war with a sense of supreme command, everything coming up to a hierarchy, to a pinnacle in the war cabinet. In 1916, David Lloyd George became Prime Minister having forced out his predecessor. Lloyd George was a charismatic figure. He had a dramatised biopic made, which showed how, as Prime Minister, he was determined completely to reorganise the system he'd inherited. Lloyd George saw that the Cabinet had swollen dramatically to a record size. He decided to create a streamlined war Cabinet of seven. And Lloyd George set up the first cabinet office to ensure the war cabinet's decisions were circulated and carried out across Whitehall. The Prime Minister chose as his first cabinet secretary a Royal Marine turned Whitehall warrior called Maurice Hankey. Hankey was to hold the post for the next two decades, serving six prime ministers. He was known in Whitehall as the Man of Secrets. The only time Hankey ever talked publicly was at the very end of his life when he told of his appointment. On the first day that uh, Lloyd George became Prime Minister, when I shook hands with him, and he was uh, lying back in a chair, he said, you are shaking hands with the most miserable man on earth. Lloyd George felt miserable because of the weight on his shoulders in the worst war the world had ever seen. Fearing Britain might lose, he gave Hankey the task of greatly strengthening the centre of government and ensuring that the Prime Minister's writ would run across the whole of Whitehall. 
Maurice Hankey, was absolutely at the centre of the web with information coming in and knowing what was happening and, and being absolutely crucial. And indeed, he was so crucial that at the end of the First World War, Parliament voted him a gratuity of £25,000. That is well over a million pounds in today's money. And that shows how important he was seen to be. Over the past century, as the Cabinet Office has grown in power, it's had a nomadic existence across Whitehall before settling in its present home. Number 70 Whitehall has a Victorian facade, but it stands on the site of King Henry VIII's old Whitehall Palace, parts of which still exist and reek of history, political skullduggery and Hogwartian quirkiness. You enter the Cabinet Office through the perfectly preserved Tudor cockpit passage and the second Queen Elizabeth was escorted on a visit here 20 years ago by the then Cabinet Secretary, Sir Robin Butler. This was the side of the old Whitehall Palace that was used for sports and pastimes in the times of Henry VIII. And in these buildings here, the Tudor and Stuart kings used to play tennis while the courtiers watched them through the window and kept the score. I always feel that's rather symbolic of the Cabinet Office work. The kings and their courtiers would watch cockfighting and bear baiting here, and they would hunt stags in the palace grounds which are now St James's Park. Upstairs, the remains of King Henry VIII's real or royal tennis court, with its 40-foot drop to the ground floor, still survives. And the 18th century treasury room still houses the gilded chair of state that was made for King George I. Here, the king would chair meetings of his ministers that became known as the cabinet. But there's another part of the Cabinet Office that remains off-limits for security reasons. Between the Cabinet Office, which fronts onto Whitehall, and number 10, there's a locked door. And that symbolised, I always felt, the separation of the Cabinet Office from number 10. And, of course, it was famously featured in Yes, Prime Minister when uh, Jim Hacker gets so fed up with Sir Humphrey coming through the whole time, he changes the lock on the door. Bernard? Yes? I'm coming through to number 10. I'm sorry, Sir Humphrey. No, it is not convenient. I'm coming anyway. He thinks he's coming anyway. Historically accurate. In fact, the first week that I was Cabinet Secretary, I went to go through that locked door into number 10 and found that there was a man changing the lock. And I said, well, it's very discouraging. I've only been in the office about two or three days. Has the Prime Minister told you to change the lock? And the man had obviously, who was fitting it, had seen the programme because he said, no, it's, somebody's lost their key, so we've got to uh, change the lock. But I have a key here for you, Sir Robin. Was that famous green baize door ever locked in your time? It was locked, but I had a key. We didn't, have, we didn't at that time have a, a, pre, a press button pad. It was all on a key, but I had the key. But the key always fitted, did it? Oh, the key always fitted, yes. We didn't have a... There was no episode uh, like that in Yes, Prime Minister. <laughs> <laughs> I never had any... I didn't have to crawl over the window sills or anything like that. <laughs> did it ever happen to you that, that um, you couldn't get through the door into number 10? Not yet, is what I would say. <laughs> so, so far, so good. But I'm afraid I, I have to reveal to you the door doesn't exist anymore. And that your viewers that are used to spooks would, would, would be able to recognise the fact that it's now one of those tubes that you stand in and then are allowed out the other side. So the door is no more. Since the Second World War, the Cabinet Secretary's palatial 18th century office has housed a succession of real-life Sir Humphreys. Their relationship with Number 10 and the interplay between personality and power form a hidden history of life at the top of government. The first post-war cabinet secretary served for nearly 20 years and was seen as a role model by his successors. He was Sir Norman Brooke, the product of Wolverhampton School and Oxford, a high flyer in the Home Office 
Brooke had been Deputy Secretary of Churchill's War Cabinet. He was also literally a cabinet maker who made his own furniture in his workshop. Norman Brooke was an extraordinary figure. He oversaw the building of the huge mixed economy and welfare state, all the nationalizations, creation of the health service and so on in the Attlee years. But also at the same time, because of the Cold War, he was essentially the number one architect of the Cold War secret state. Norman Brooke saw it as his job to think the unthinkable if the Cold War were to turn hot. Communist Russia had recently acquired its own H-bomb. As a nuclear power itself, Britain was seen as a prime target for a preemptive Soviet strike. And at the Cabinet Office, Norman Brooke worked in total secrecy on the doomsday scenario. Norman Brooke constructed this enormously elaborate and immensely secret state to cope with the Cold War where intelligence met civil defence, where it met home defence, where all the plans for post-attack were made. Norman Brook was seen as the indispensable right-hand man by four successive Prime Ministers, from Labour's Clement Attlee to the Conservative Harold Macmillan, whom he served for seven years. Norman Brook was a great public servant. He was always calm, always unruffled, without any show, without any glamour. And he was the friend and advisor of more than one prime minister. And to all in turn, he gave equal loyalty and devotion. Norman Brooke had shown that devotion to Anthony Eden, Macmillan's controversial predecessor as prime minister. At number 10, Eden had secretly conspired with the French and the Israelis to invade Egypt. Troops were sent to seize back the Suez Canal from Colonel Nasser, the Egyptian military strongman. The Suez invasion sparked bitter controversy in Britain. Downing Street was under siege, and inside number 10, the cabinet secretary, Norman Brooke, revealed to the government chief whip that Eden had just given him a highly irregular order. Norman Brooke came out of the cabinet room and said, he's told me to uh, burn the lot of them. To burn the lot of what? The documents. The secret documents? Yeah. And well, is... yes, they were government documents. And is that what, what um, Norman Brooke, the Cabinet Secretary, went off and did? Yes. And what did you feel about that? Well, they, the Cabinet Secretary was carrying out the Prime Minister's order, uh, orders about Cabinet documents. But uh, what did you feel about a cabinet secretary going off and um, destroying secret documents, which, if they'd become public, would prove that the Prime Minister had lied to the House? Yes. What did you feel about that? The cabinet secretary was doing his job. He was only obeying orders? Yes. Anthony Eden asked Norman Brooke to destroy the cabinet papers relating to the conspiracy over Suez, which Norman Brooke did. Did. I Would it. you, if you had been Cabinet Secretary, ordered by the Prime Minister to, to destroy Cabinet papers related to a conspiracy for uh, an invasion, would you have done so? No one knows how you behave until you're in that situation, but I hope I would not. I mean, I am obsessive about paper. I keep everything. Uh, I, would have, I, I think I would have found the whole episode of the series impossible, very difficult to serve. I think a matter of conscience would have, would, would, I think, seriously. Indeed, I think I've talked to permanent secretaries of that time, and I think there were a number of permanent secretaries who were very seriously close to resigning in protest about it. Well, I think it's uh, reprehensible. I think the right answer would be to tell a prime minister you destroyed them, but, you, but you'd actually not. I don't think that's certainly what I would have done. I wouldn't have, uh, uh, wouldn't have destroyed papers, because it was, in a sense, my reputation as well. I mean, I think it's a pretty despicable thing to do. Brooke did destroy them, but being a good civil servant, he put a note on the file saying that he'd been instructed by the Prime Minister to destroy them. Over two decades, Norman Brooke kept the confidences and the trust of all four of the very different Prime Ministers he served. And he never gave an interview. He really was a man of secrets. There's no way of calibrating 
the weight of secrecy anybody carries at any one particular time for obvious reasons because you don't know what they know. But Norman Brook, per square inch, had more secrets than any other figure in post-war uh, Whitehall, right through until the moment he retired in 1963. As Cabinet Secretary, Brook remained unknown to the public, and his successor was an equally self-effacing figure. Sir Burke Trend served Labour's Harold Wilson and three other Prime Ministers over a decade from 1963. Trend had been top man at the Treasury and had a double first in classics from Oxford. But he saw Britain becoming a much more violent place. Industrial disputes were turning ugly. And there were bombing campaigns on the British mainland by the provisional IRA and other terrorist groups. To counter threats to the security of the state, Bertrand's cabinet office had set up a new emergency center. It was to become known to the public by its sinister near acronym, COBRA. The highly secret new center's task was to coordinate the intelligence and security forces and respond fast to a crisis. COBRA is, is actually, it sounds great, but it, it does in fact stand for cabinet office briefing rooms, rather mundane, but it's the place where we can brief the Prime Minister and bring together people through video screens and audio links and various sophisticated technology. There are accusations that opening COBRA is a bit of a look at me jumping kind of response, but actually it's a way of making sure you've got the security, intelligence, the police, emergency services, whoever you need for the, the nature of the crisis itself can be brought together uh, in one place and able to communicate very rapidly with one another. You're able to make decisions, have the drumbeat so that you're getting all the latest information. These are very fast-moving situations. Find out what's actually happening. Make clear that what everyone's going to say publicly, what new information you need, what new actions you need to take, and then get on with uh, making sure that you deal with the incident. COBRA, in the early 1970s, when it was first constructed, was also the war room, the decision-taking forum, for transition to World War III. And at one end of it, separated from the main committee room, was the nuclear release room where the Prime Minister would have gone if he was in town and if he wasn't incinerated to do it. It was the only nuclear bunker in a capital of a nuclear power that's ever been above ground. Quite extraordinary. That COBRA remains the first port of call to coordinate responses to national emergencies is a significant legacy of Sir Burke Trend's time as Cabinet Secretary. In his 10 years as top Mandarin, he was highly regarded as a subtle advisor by the four prime ministers he served, with one exception. Well, Bertrand's style was not to tell you what to do, and certainly not to tell ministers what to do, but to lead them by a notion of posing questions, which is sometimes called a Socratic approach, uh, to which would bring them to the solutions that he thought were probably appropriate. And he would put this in his briefing for the Prime Minister. And when Mr Heath came in, Mr Heath, being a more managerial style of Prime Minister, expected people to tell him what they recommended he should do. And in exasperation at this, at one stage, wrote on the top of the minute, I am the Prime Minister, I ask the questions, you are supposed to give the answers. Labour's Harold Wilson took a rather different view of Burke Trend's abilities to see his way through the fog of government. Harold Wilson described Burke Trend as the best civil servant he'd known. The American president, Richard Nixon's state visit to Britain provided a telling instance of how the cabinet secretary could subtly diffuse embarrassment for a prime minister. Wilson had invited the president to address a meeting of the cabinet. His ministers and Burke Trend were waiting in the cabinet room to hear Nixon. Nixon really gave a brilliant exposition of the world as it was seen through the eyes of the United States president. Held us all extremely interesting. Then there was a sort of pause before we went on with the discussion when coffee was brought in. And in some way I still can't quite work out. In either putting milk or sugar or not into his coffee, he managed to pick up one of the very heavy inkwells which were on the table in Downing Street and pour the ink over his hands. 
It was seen of absolute consternation, Bogart. I mean, Nixon was consternated by it, if that's a word, but everybody else was. Burke Trend, the extremely austere secretary of the cabinet, spilled a jug of cream over his own trousers. And I said, I've never been able to decide whether this was because he was so shaken by what was happening, or because he thought that um, if um, he introduced the idea that a bit of slapstick was a dining street habit, it might make the person feel more at home. One of the most extraordinary scenes I've ever witnessed. After Burke Trend, the next guardian of the door from the Cabinet Office to Number 10 was Sir John Hunt, the product of public school, Cambridge and naval intelligence. He was dedicated to building up his personal power across Whitehall. John Hunt had a very strong sense that he was on this earth for a divine purpose and that that purpose was to help government operate effectively. I mentioned in my diary at the time, I said, Hunt's face is curiously colourless and his mouth flickers in a quick smile. His eyes are fierce. He could run a machine very efficiently on behalf of any ideology. When Harold Wilson returned to power in 1974, he brought Bernard Donoghue from LSE to work with Marcia Williams and Joe Haynes as his closest special advisors. They were to provide a political counterweight to the official advice from John Hunt and the civil service. And each night, a battle would be fought over what went into Harold Wilson's red boxes. Sir John Hunt felt that the cabinet secretary should have the last word with the prime minister, so he was deeply upset that I would always wait until after he had submitted the cabinet office policy memo to the Prime Minister and then I would read it in the Prime Minister's box in the private office and then submit some comments from us. No word of Hunt's behind the scenes battles for Wilson's ear reached the public. For Hunt was an ardent believer in complete secrecy about the inner workings of government. But all that was to change as a result of diaries written by Richard Crossman, who'd been one of Harold Wilson's senior cabinet ministers. Crossman had kept extremely candid accounts of what really went on in Cabinet, which he wanted published, but which John Hunt wanted the High Court to ban. Hunt emerged from the shadows to give evidence in court. Sir so John Hunt, the Cabinet Secretary, said, in answer to questions, the Crossman diaries were in a different class from other political memoirs. One principal departure was that Crossman had attributed individual views to ministers in Cabinet meetings. Crossman's behaviour, he said, made it impossible for a cabinet to work together in mutual trust. It is the first time that people see the whites of the eyes, if you like, of the cabinet secretary under pressure where they're up against it. And that must have been extremely uncomfortable for someone who had spent most of their life in, in the back room, suddenly to be thrust into the limelight. Hunt and the government lost the case and the Crossman diaries were published. Hunt's successor, was to be similarly exposed to the public. Sir Robert Armstrong was a product of Eton, Oxford and the Treasury. Unusually for a cabinet secretary, he served just one prime minister, Mrs Thatcher. And his critics claimed that he came to identify himself too closely with serving her interests. She was a conviction politician. She and I got along very well together. Um, and and um, I survived the course with her. Now, any other points that we wish to raise generally before we go on to the main business? Like all cabinet secretaries, Armstrong would sit at the Prime Minister's right-hand side at cabinet. He had the role of Mrs Thatcher's enforcer. It required vetting her appointment of new ministers. One in particular, the colourful Alan Clark, had attracted the attention of MI5. I had a meeting with Robert Armstrong. He sent for me. He just produced a couple of files and said there are certain matters which the Prime Minister has asked me to draw to your attention. He said, you've been spoken of with approval. So I agreed by something. Quite right, too, I almost said. By the National Front, he, said. he snarled. We had a report from the Security Service who expressed worry about the possibility of a relationship with the National Front. He said that he had no relationship with the National Front, he had no use for them. Admittedly, he had some right-wing views and they sub sometimes commended them, but that didn't mean that he had anything to do with them, and I accepted that, of course. And then he produced another file, he said, um, 
And there are certain matters in relation to your personal conduct that uh, make, would make open to blackmail. Complete nonsense, really. I mean, my personal conduct is probably um, open to criticism at some times. What was he referring to? Uh, he was referring to... Uh, I suppose he was referring to relationships with, uh, with other women that... Um, my, well, we've seen what relationships with women can do to ministers. And he said, you don't need to worry about that, he said. My, those are, I, I have, these affairs are no secret at all. All my friends know about them and my wife knows all about them. And if anybody tried to blackmail me about them, I should say publish and be damned. I thought that was probably true. So I reported accordingly to Mrs Thatcher. Elsewhere in his diary, he, he said, if you want my opinion of, of Robert Armstrong, he's a full colonel in the KGB. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was given the same things like that, wasn't he? In fact, the Cabinet Office is the epicentre of British intelligence, and Robert Armstrong was Mrs Thatcher's top advisor on security and espionage. He was to find himself embroiled in the notorious spy catcher affair. It involved the maverick MI5 agent Peter Wright, who'd written sensational memoirs that were to be published in Australia where he lived in exile. Mrs Thatcher wanted Armstrong to fly over to give evidence in the Australian High Court to prevent publication. The Prime Minister said, well, will you go, Robert? I, I'm not going to instruct you to go. I'm, uh, I'm asking you to go and you're free to say no. And Do you think I, you really were free to say no? Well, no, in, I didn't think I should say no, certainly. But um, I, I think... She quite, she, quite answer, yes. she quite deliberately put it like that so that I shouldn't feel that I was being instructed to go against my will, as it were. I don't think Robert Armstrong should have been invited by the Prime Minister to go to Australia to defend the British government's position on Spycatcher. That was for ministers. It's intensely political. But Armstrong's trip had a shaky start, but the Cabinet Secretary was unaccustomed to facing the media spotlight. They crowded round me, and I, um, uh, they got in the way as well with the cameras. And, uh, These are the photographers, Yes, yeah. and I, I hate flying anyway, and it was quite a sensitive mission. And I felt very... I, I must have lost my, lost my cool for a moment. What uh, did you do? I, I pushed a camera out of the way. Pushed a camera rather than punched a photographer? I didn't punch the photographer. I just thrust the camera out of the way. I think it fell out of his hand onto the floor. I don't know whether it was damaged or not, but he never sent me the bill. But in the Australian court, Armstrong came up against one of the country's most aggressive lawyers, who accused the Cabinet Secretary of lying in the witness box. So I said that I hadn't told any lies. Perhaps I had been economical with the truth. And the British press jumped onto this phrase, economical with the truth, and wrote it up as lying in the, in the press, and uh, it became a, a notorious phrase. It's got me into the Oxford Dictionary of Quotations. Uh. I admired Robert for going, but I think he should have said no. He really put his reputation on the line for his prime minister and his government. It must have been ghastly from beginning to end. Robert Armstrong retired after eight years as cabinet secretary. His critics claimed he'd been too willing to do the Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher's bidding. Armstrong's successor, Sir Robin Butler, was determined to do things differently and restore the Cabinet Secretary to his traditional role of serving the Cabinet as a whole. Butler had long been seen as the golden boy of Whitehall, destined to reach the top. He'd been a high flyer who'd gained a rugby blue and first-class degree after a privileged education. Harrow, University College, Oxford, history and philosophy. From Oxford, Butler went straight to the Treasury, the elite civil service training ground. But his promising career was almost shattered in its first year when he appeared in the Treasury Christmas play. He'd organized an explosion that was so violent that a glass bowl flew off the stage and crashed onto the head of Sir Norman Brooke, the legendary cabinet secretary. But Butler was forgiven and went on to work in Number 10 as private secretary for a succession of prime ministers before reaching the top of the Whitehall greasy pole. <laughs>
on timing, you see. Every lap, I've got to do it in under 20 minutes. The new cabinet secretary would keep fit in his local Lido in South London. I'm Sir Humphrey, and yes, uh, yes, Minister. So, um, my job is to be the chief engineer in the engine room of the government. The normally hidden engine room of the government is the weekly meeting in the cabinet office of the Sir Humphreys from each Whitehall ministry, the permanent secretaries. At the meeting chaired by the cabinet secretary, the mandarins seek to coordinate government business for the week ahead. It is, in effect, a real shadow cabinet. Butler wanted the cabinet office to work for the whole cabinet and not be used by number 10 solely for the benefit of the prime minister. I've always had the view that the Cabinet Office has a different role from that of Number 10. There are some people who think that the Cabinet Office ought to be a sort of Prime Minister's department. But I think the system works best if the staff, hopefully quite a small number of staff who are in Number 10, both civil servants and political, wholly devoted to the Prime Minister and the Prime Minister's interests. And the Cabinet Office are the honest brokers in the system. The Prime Minister Butler worked for longest as Cabinet Secretary was John Major. They had a close relationship, sharing many interests such as cricket. And Butler found Major to be the best negotiator he'd worked for. But it was a turbulent time. And Butler also had to deal with the very powerful figure of Michael Heseltine, whom Major appointed to be his Deputy Prime Minister. Hezer was to be based in the cabinet office, with a brief that ranged across the whole of government. John Major asked Michael Heseltine to come through and talk to me about ideas which Michael had for the structure of government. And as, as we were coming to the end of that discussion, he said, of course, I'll need a room worthy of the deputy prime minister. And uh, so he said, this room here you've got is a very nice room. Robin had the most palatial office you've ever seen. Ah, no cabinet minister has ever had an office like that. And I said, well, nice to see you, Robin, and everything sat down, looked around, and I said, this is a very nice office. Michael Heseltine then told Robin Butler the story of a previous Tory cabinet minister called Duncan Sands, who'd been so impressed by the grand office of his top Mandarin that he felt he should take it over for himself. How did he react when you told him that story? Because I think he thinks you said, well, why don't I have this office? This is a very nice office. Well, I, 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 I don't think I ever quite said that, but the, the very clear implication was that Duncan Sands had, it, had said he'd have that office, and I was about to do the same. So I said, um, this is traditionally the Cabinet Secretary's room, but I could see that wasn't going to take the trick, and so I said to him, we've got an even better room for you upstairs. So he said... Uh, Oh, well, can I see it? So I said, well, it's, uh, we'll have to get it ready for you. And so let's make an appointment for tomorrow morning and uh, come back and see it. And so he went off and I went out to my uh, staff and said, I have no idea what room I'm talking about, but uh, uh, what can we do? And so they said, well, there is conference room B, which is the size of uh, half a tennis court, but there's a huge uh, table in it. So I said, well, even if you have to uh, get the Royal Engineers over from the Ministry of Defence, get the table out. Next day, I took Michael Heseltine upstairs and uh, we walked in at the door, which was one corner of the room, and uh, we looked across this room. It was huge, much too big, uh, but, but <laughs> it was a defensive response from Sir Humphrey. <laughs> he says that you said to him, as you looked at the office, you said to him, I think you and I are going to get along. <laughs> it's exactly what I would have said. And from that point, there was no difficulty. But there was a sequel to the story, which was the day of the election, in, uh, when we lost the election in 97. Uh, uh, and Robin, I'm told, was seen in his shirt sleeves, helping people to restore the cabinet committee room that had been my office to make sure that no one else got it. When New Labour came to power, Tony Blair wanted radically to reform the traditional way of running a government. And Robin Butler fell out with Blair over the new Prime Minister's plans to give Number 10 much greater power and control over cabinet ministers. <laughs> 
Butler strongly objected to Blair's style of working informally with his close, personally appointed political advisers like Alastair Campbell, a style that Butler was later to dub sofa government. Tony Blair said about you that Robin Butler was a traditionist with all the strengths and weaknesses and reverence for tradition that that would imply. Is that a fair picture of you as cabinet secretary? I don't think it is a fair picture. I, you know, I was associated with a lot of reforms to the civil service, um, some of which some of my colleagues thought went too far. And uh, yeah, I believe in progress and uh, reform. But I, if, you, if the accusation is that I supported the traditional cabinet government as opposed to sofa government, that is an accusation that I'm perfectly willing to plead guilty to. Well, I do think the attack on sofa government is one of the most ridiculous things I've ever heard in my life. I mean, the weakness of the argument in particular is shown by their basing it on an item of furniture rather than anything else, if that's really important. It doesn't actually matter if you're sitting on a sofa or around a coffin-shaped table when you're making a decision. It is a sort of death rattle of the Mandarin class. It's people venting their anger as they see a system disappear. The Blairites saw Butler as the quintessential Sir Humphrey figure. The smooth reassurance on the surface masking the obstructiveness beneath. What the butler saw was the very different relationships he'd had as cabinet secretary with the three prime ministers he'd served. I was once asked what was the difference between working for Margaret Thatcher and John Major and Tony Blair. And I would say that if you said something critical of that sort to Margaret Thatcher, she would be affronted. What do you mean? How could you say that? But she wouldn't, it wouldn't rupture your relationship with her. If you said something uh, critical to t uh, John Major, he'd be sad. He'd say, oh, do you really think we made such a mess of it? And if you said something critical to Tony Blair, he'd say, you're absolutely right. Quite agree with you. But you wouldn't really know whether he did. Butler left number 10 after agreeing with Tony Blair on the senior Mandarin to replace him. And the outgoing cabinet secretary had tipped the wink to his successor. Robin said to me, I don't want you to acknowledge you know this, but the Prime Minister is going to ask to see you this afternoon. He's going to ask you if you will be prepared to be Cabinet Secretary, and I just want you to prepare you for it uh, and to make sure you say the right thing. And, and I, was, I was sort of bowled over by this. It was extraordinary, and sure enough, the phone call came. And I went into the room and sat down and said, Tony Blair said, now, I want to talk about well, how we're going to tackle a job. And I said, hold on, well, should you... He said, he's, oh, you, Robin will have told you. I mean, I want you to be Cabinet Secretary, but no, let's talk about what you're going to do. In other words, we went straight into the job. And I have this theory, I've never been asked to do it. I'm not objecting, I was delighted. <laughs> <laughs> Blair's new Cabinet Secretary had a can-do reputation. And the public school and Cambridge-educated Wilson aimed to become the Prime Minister's indispensable right-hand man, but he faced stiff competition. What Tony uh, wanted to do was to sort of operate through his own tight, personally appointed circle. And I think that Richard Wilson, when he became Cabinet Secretary following Robin, never quite succeeded in overcoming that slight distance, that slight detachment uh, that Tony had injected into the relationship between him and his top civil servants. Richard felt that Robin had allowed himself to be too distant and too uh, outside number 10. Richard uh, had made his name as the Deputy Secretary in the Cabinet Office who had resolved problems for Mrs Thatcher and really played a central role there. And he wanted to be, be in that role, but he fell into this category, I think, of trying to force himself too much on the Prime Minister, which then made the Prime Minister sort of less keen to, to have his advice. So his reacting against what he perceived Robin to have done led him to be uh, perhaps too, too keen, too enthusiastic. For his part, Blair had visions of annexing the Cabinet Office and its staff to work directly for him in a new, powerful, all-singing, all-dancing department of the Prime Minister. A couple of times while we were in Number 10, Tony looked at the idea of having a Prime Minister's department, whether they should actually reinforce Number 10 and make it into a full department with the requisite number of civil servants and budgets and what have you. And when we did it with Richard, he didn't like the idea at all. He thought we were making a mistake and he said it was unconstitutional, he tried to stop us doing it. And when we tried to appoint more staff to Number 10, he thought we were trying to do it by the back door and vetoed that. I have to admit to you that I was pretty strongly of the view that it was not a good idea, uh, partly because of my abiding belief in collective responsibility. I also think 
it was in a way about um, accumulating more power to a man who I thought was already remarkably powerful. And I think that uh, and this concept of building him up into a president uh, was one that which was, was really very dangerous politically in all sorts of ways. The presidential Tony Blair was becoming increasingly disillusioned, both with his cabinet secretary and with the cabinet office itself, and especially its much trumpeted role of being able to act quickly and effectively in the face of a sudden emergency. In September 2000, a dramatic challenge came out of the blue. A motley group of farmers and lorry drivers seeking fuel duty cuts used French-style tactics to blockade oil refineries. Tony Blair, we told you back in May that we had troubles in the countryside. Maybe you'll listen now when we get the same effect as what's happening in France. Less than 100 people uh, in the protest organised with scarcely any structure and just mobile phones came uncomfortably close to bringing the economy to a halt in the space of very few days. The protesters snarled up major roads and blockaded city centres. And with motorists panic buying, the pumps were running dry. Tony Blair ordered his number 10 staff and the cabinet secretary to get an immediate grip on the situation. What we did was open up COBRA, the cabinet office briefing room, and we put a very big effort into making that an effective uh, mechanism for, uh, for, for, for dealing with the crisis. And, and what was Tony Blair's reaction when the petrol tankers stayed stuck in the refineries? Oh, frustration. Because it ought to be possible to make that happen from this powerful centre of government. People didn't realise at the time quite how close it was. Hospitals were about to close down. All the ATMs in Britain, all the cash machines were about to close down. We were thinking of invoking emergency powers and having to put the military on the street. It came very close. And only at the last minute were we able to finally get the thing moving again. Alistair Campbell, in his diaries, said that the Cabinet Office and COBRA, defended to the hilt by Richard Wilson, was hopeless during that. That's what he says in his diary. Well, we weren't hopeless, actually. In fact, we were pretty good. Um, I remember that there was a view in number 10 that we were hopeless, and I think it was the, I would argue, my memory is, that it was the occasion when the Prime Minister began to see that COBRA uh, and, and the Civil Contingencies Unit were, were useful and important in times of crisis. But Richard Wilson now became the victim of a number of personal attacks on his competence. Unnamed sources close to the Prime Minister told the media that Tony Blair had lost confidence in his Cabinet Secretary. Richard felt that the Downing Street machine had been ganging up on him and briefing against him, and I think it made him feel unsettled. And we, we got quite an outburst from him at one point on, on, on that, which was quite difficult to handle. What, did he, what happened? Well, he had a, a rather stormy encounter with, with Tony, and, um, and then withdrew behind the Green Bay's door, because Tony gave him back as good as he got. Um, when Richard was sort of um, being fairly um, dismissive of the record of the government and the way the government uh, worked, uh, Tony reacted quite strongly to the sort of um, saying, will we made peace afterwards? I am not aware that he ever lost confidence in me. Uh, my relationship with him was good right up to the uh, point at which I retired. Uh, he asked my views on things. It's also true that my power began to wane once my successor was appointed, which was April 2002. But I still went to meetings in Number 10. Blair's third cabinet secretary in five years was Andrew Turnbull, who'd been a Number 10 private secretary. Educated at grammar school in Oxford, Turnbull used the same Lido as Robin Butler. I'm the permanent secretary of the Department of the Environment. Turnbull had gone on to become top Mandarin at the Treasury. Right, OK. Well, I'd better go then. Just put that in my, uh, put that in my shoe. He's your top policy man. On leaders. He was uh, Margaret Thatcher's private section man. Cabinet secretary. <laughs> <coughs> And your neighbours. <coughs> As cabinet secretary, did you try and get closer in terms of working with Tony Blair than you had seen it happen with both Robin Butler and Richard Wilson? Um, 
Well, I think I tried. I don't think I got a lot closer than they did. Um, I just don't just think, think that wasn't the way that they, they wanted to work. Tony Blair never really viewed any of his cabinet secretaries uh, as those really sort of trusted, experienced, safe pairs of hands, um, close-up advisers, uh, um, in the way that previous prime ministers had regarded uh, the holders of that job. His time as cabinet secretary sometimes reminded Turnbull of the episode of Yes, Prime Minister, where Jim Hacker had managed to get one over Sir Humphrey. Oh, look, it's Humphrey. <laughs> and it's been enshrined in history, the famous episode where Sir Humphrey is being taunted by the removal of his his key and a poor soul has to climb around the windows and is banging on saying please let me in uh, that is the you know, that is the fate that he befalls you if you become seriously uh, marginalised but did that uh, fate ever befall you? Uh, no I don't think I was ever seriously marginalised maybe I was marginalised but not seriously so so how, how frustrating did you find your time as cabinet secretary? I didn't think it was that frustrating at the time. As I look back, I'm more, I'm more frustrated. Turnbull handed over to Gus O'Donnell after four dispiriting years. Sir Gus came from a rather different background from traditional cabinet secretaries. He'd gone to a South London state school and read economics at Warwick University. After a PhD at Oxford, he'd been a university lecturer before joining the Treasury as an economist. At the Treasury, he rose fast, and after a spell as press secretary to the Prime Minister, John Major, O'Donnell became permanent secretary to the Treasury under the Chancellor, Gordon Brown. The South Londoner was a keen footballer and a fan of Manchester United. I am a Cockney Red. I have supported Manchester United all my life through thick and thin. The Cockney Red's people skills and media experience endeared him both to Brown and Tony Blair and O'Donnell was made Cabinet Secretary in 2005. Hi, welcome. Welcome to the Cabinet Secretary's room. Uh, this has got a lot of history to it. Just outside the historic room, O'Donnell installed this motivational slogan. The slogan was originally used about a martyred French saint who was said to have walked for six miles, carrying his own severed head under his arm while preaching a sermon. After Tony Blair lost his head to Gordon Brown, O'Donnell remained Cabinet Secretary. Sitting next to Brown, O'Donnell believed part of his job was to see round political corners. Looking into his crystal ball, the mystic mega of the Cabinet Office set his officials to work. They acted out the roles of politicians in different scenarios for a hung Parliament. It's kind of summed up by the Boy Scouts motto, be prepared. I mean, we wanted to be prepared for all possible outcomes. Now, I'd like to be able to tell you that we worked through that successfully, but in fact, we had individual civil servants playing the parts of the different leaders, and as civil servants, we failed to come up with a deal there because actually we'd given very tight negotiating remits to those people. In reality, uh, the political parties were much more successful than that, and they managed to come to an agreement. After the general election had produced a hung parliament and four days of negotiation in the Cabinet Office, the new coalition government had been born, with Gus O'Donnell as the midwife. For me, as Cabinet Secretary, this was a momentous occasion. Post-war, there hasn't been a full coalition government, and for us, we were in uncharted territories. What emerged, the Conservative Liberal Democrat coalition, then worked very intensively with the civil service to produce their program for government. When the co-hosts of the coalition went to their first cabinet meeting, David Cameron told his ministers they were the latest additions to the long list that Gus O'Donnell had served as cabinet secretary. 85 different cabinet ministers, so um, that's, uh, 
And you've still got a further 15 years to go if you want to be the longest serving cabinet secretary, which is Morris Hainton from 1998. So you're just really starting out. <laughs> like many new prime ministers, David Cameron made immediate changes to the cabinet office. He set up a new White House-style National Security Council that would work in the Cabinet Office. The Prime Minister chairs a top-level weekly meeting of the NSC in the Cabinet Room itself. It brings together our military and spy chiefs with ministers and mandarins. Their task is to identify, in a strategic way, threats from the enemies of the state. The heads of the uh, Security Service and the Secret Intelligence Service have laid out there is a very serious threat, believe me. And this Prime Minister has taken that, as, as past Prime Ministers, very, very seriously indeed. On the domestic front, Sir Gus says he has a new mantra, supporting the Prime Minister and supporting the Deputy Prime Minister, who's based in the Cabinet Office. Well, I would describe myself as the equidistant Cabinet Secretary between the Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister. From this office, where we're filming now, it is, and I've counted it, 50 paces to get to the Prime Minister's office and 50 paces to get to the Deputy Prime Minister's office. And I think that's a very nice balance to have. The coalition government has made Sir Gus the highest profile Cabinet Secretary ever, and the top trio take the stage with Sir Gus looking every inch the third among equals. And now the man who really holds the ring, uh, Gus, over to you. Thank you very much, Prime Minister, Deputy Prime Minister. Our what this has meant for us is that we have a completely different way of operating. And that's because, as civil servants, we have put across the message that whenever a policy decision comes up, we need to coalitionise it. That means very early on, making sure that it works across the two political parties. Civil service in the Cabinet Office are much happier now with the coalition government because by, nature, by virtue of it being a coalition, they have to discuss everything all the time. They have to t listen to each other's views. They have to have committees again. Um, I mean, collective government and responsibility really does have to start operating again when you're welding together two separate parties and putting them together in the same government makes the Cabinet Office much happier uh, because it sort of fulfills their historic role. But recently there have been strains in the relationship between the Cabinet Secretary and the Prime Minister. Gus O'Donnell, who signs his paperwork with the initials G.O.D., wrote a secret memo urging the government to draw up a Plan B for the economy if the Coalition's Plan A of huge spending cuts doesn't work. Cameron was furious when the memo leaked to the media. As far as your relationship with David Cameron is concerned, it's said that he had words with you after uh, a memo which you'd written about Plan B had, had leaked. Uh, I'm not going to get involved in uh, discussions about current policy. You're not going to get involved, but how long are you going to stay as Cabinet Secretary? <laughs> well, I've been in the job five years. The one thing I'll say is to beat Morris Henke's record, I need to do another 17, and I'm not going to do that. In its 100-year history, the ten cabinet secretaries have all been men. And although Whitehall whispers are that there might be the first ever Dame Humphrey Appleby, it looks more likely that Sir Gus's successor will also be a man. Whoever gets the job, the cabinet secretary's most sensitive task remains, judging when to say no prime minister. Next week, what's really gone on over the years behind the black door of number 10. Thank you.